Um, welcome to the Center for Ethics and Human Values, um, our, month, our monthly conversation around research ethics. Um, the aim of CARE is to build a community around research integrity at Ohio State, and we try to do this by hosting multidisciplinary conversations about the thorny ethical challenges that researchers face at Ohio State and at Nationwide um, uh, in the course of their research. And I'm so excited for you all to join us. Um, we're grateful for funding provided by the Office of Research to make these panels happen, and also for the support of the OSUMC um, Center for Bioethics, along with the OSU College of Public Health. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the ethics of research involving children. Uh, research with minor, minors is of critical importance to advance knowledge about how to safeguard their well being, um, ensure educational opportunities, and our health. But at the same time, children are considered a vulnerable population and are granted extra legal protection. So today we're going to really be talking about how to conduct the much needed research, but at the same time as respecting children's rights. And I'm delighted to have um, a multidisciplinary panel. Um, with us today, we have Dave Wendler, who is the head of the section on research ethics in the Department of Bioethics at the NIH Center uh, Clinical Center. Um, he's a leading expert on research ethics and research involving children. He's the author of The Ethics of Pediatric Research from Oxford University Press in 2010. And he's written widely on topics such as assent in pediatric, pediatric research, assessing research risks systematically, research with stored biological samples, and protecting communities um, in biomedical research when it comes to exploitation. We also have Molly Blackburn, who is a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning in the College of Education and Human Ecology here at Ohio State University. Her research focuses on literacy, language, and social change with particular attention to LGBTQ youth and their teachers. Um, she's the author of Interrupting Hate, Homophobia in Schools and What Literacy Can Do About It, and the co-editor of Acting Out, Combating Homophobia Through Teacher Activism. Welcome. And then we also have Dr. Mark Hall, who is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics um, in the Division of Clinical, Clinical Care Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital and at the Ohio State uh, University College of Medicine. He's the chief of the Division of Critical Care Medicine, um, and he's the in, uh, Developmental Board Endowed Chair in Critical Care Medicine and Director of Immune Surveillance Laboratory at the Research Institute at Nationwide. Um, his primary research area focuses on immuno, immunobiology of critical uh, pediatric critical illness, and he's uh, the principal investigator at the Nationwide Children's Hospital um, in the NICHD's Collaborative Pediatric Critical Care Research Network, which um, I take it you and Dr. Wendler have worked together on. So welcome everybody. Um, we are going to start with um, Dave and he's going to present some of the ethical challenges that he's worked on in the past 20, 30 uh, years of his research and some of the challenges. <laughs> I don't know how long it's been. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> Um, and the challenges that um, you find to be the most pressing um, right now. Um, and then I'm gonna um, invite Molly and Mark to present just opening, re opening remarks about your own um, experiences and challenges with research involving kids. And then afterwards, I have a set of questions. We'll just have a discussion, um, but then I really want to open it up to Q&A and give us a chance to um, go through some questions from the audience. Um, so I invite you, dear audience member, to look down at the bottom of the Zoom uh, panel. There's a QA and a uh, little like symbol thing. Click there throughout the presentation if you have any um, questions. We're going to um, ask those questions the last 20 minutes or so of the panel. This is also, there is also closed captioning, um, live uh, closed captioning available. So feel free to use those services. And to no further ado, um, welcome Dave. Thanks, Dana. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. What I'm gonna to try to do is just give a little bit of background to explain how I think about the ethics of pediatric research in general. And as Dana mentioned, I'm at the NIH. I've been at the NIH for essentially my whole career now, about 27 years. 
And because of the type of research that NIH does, I typically, when I think about research, I think about drug trials for the most part. And so I'm gonna speak in those terms, but the issues that I'm gonna raise are general to other types of pediatric research. So we can talk about those as well. So this story and the way I think about pediatric ethics research starts for me in sixth grade in Mr. Miller's social studies class. So you're thinking, boy, this is gonna be a really long story now. So that's when I learned that a friend of mine had a serious illness and needed to get medicine to treat his illness. And I started thinking, how do doctors do that? How do doctors figure out which drugs to give my friend for the disease he has? And then I realized other kids had different diseases and how did doctors figure out what drugs to give them for their diseases. And as I was sitting there over the next couple of months in sixth grade, I was a budding philosopher already. And I thought, well, it must work something like this. Doctors are really smart and they know everything about the human body. And so then what they do is they get this possible new drug and they look at it. And by looking at it, I don't think I even knew anything about molecular structures in sixth grade. I just thought they'd kind of look at it. And by looking at it, they can figure out this will work for this disease or that disease. It might give you a headache for 10 minutes, but a little bit of a stomach ache, but then it'll cure you in three days. And that's the way I thought drug development worked. Doctors are smart, but unfortunately they're not that smart. And the problem is that the human body is a lot more complicated than any of us can figure out. And so what I learned is it's much more simple the way we figure out what drugs work and what don't work. We sometimes look at them in the lab, we might apply them to cells, we might give them to different animals, but in the end, we basically just give them to some people and we see what happens. And that's how we learn how drugs work. And so to do that, we need eventually to test drugs in humans. So we get a couple of people, we used to call them research subjects, we try to call them research participants now, and I'll explain why we've tried to make that change over the past 10 to 15 years. And we give them those drugs and we see what happens. Does it make them sick? Does it make them really sick? Can we give them higher doses? How high of a dose can we give them? A lot of times we start with healthy people just to see if it makes them sick. And then if it doesn't make them too sick, we start giving them to people with various diseases to see if they help. And so that process is basically human subjects research with respect to drugs. And so it involves giving people drugs essentially to see how sick it makes them and then eventually to see whether it makes people better. And so the worry that leads to is that it looks like described in that way, we're just taking advantage of people. Some people talk about this in terms of treating human research subjects like guinea pigs. We're just sticking them with needles and giving them drugs to see whether or not it makes them really sick. And obviously then this just simply raises the first and I think primary ethical question for human subjects research. How do we justify that? How do we justify giving people drugs when we don't even know what they're gonna do until we give them to them? That's why we're giving to them to see what happens. How do we make sense of that ethically? Well, the standard answer that most people give is well, you take somebody who understands, like a normal competent adult, you explain what you're doing, and if they say okay, and they agree to it, then their valid consent makes it okay for you to do that, even though you're exposing them to risks for the potential benefits of other people. We can talk about how well that story works when it comes to adults, but it obviously raises real problems when we start thinking about having to test drugs in kids and little kids aren't the same as adults. And so if we wanna see if drugs work for kids, we need to give them to kids. So if we give it to a 10 year old, they can't give their own valid consent. So we can't justify what we're doing in the same way when it comes to kids. So how do we justify it? Well, here's what most rules and regulations around the world have agreed to. There's pretty similar with some differences rules. And those rules basically say you can put a 10 year old into a drug trial when one of two conditions are satisfied. Either being in that trial offers a prospect of what the US regulations call direct benefit. We just think about that a clinical or medical benefit. We talk about the differences later 
if people are interested, but basically it either has to be in that child's clinical interest to be in the trial, or if it's not in their clinical interests, then the risks, what I sometimes call the net risks of being in the trial have to be really low. So I have to give a chance of benefit where the risks have to be really low. Now it's important to notice that even in trials that offer a prospect of direct benefit, they almost always include some interventions or procedures that pose risks purely for research. So you might give the child a drug and then you have to take a couple of blood draws or you have to do an MRI scan on them purely for research. So there are always some things going on in their research context that are to learn things, won't benefit the participants, but pose risks to them. So that's justified by those risks being sufficiently low. But now remember the challenge was, this looks like exploitation or treating human beings like guinea pigs. And you might think, well, okay, lower risks are better than high risks, but just because the risks are low, why does that make it okay ethically? After all, treating somebody like a guinea pig, if you're not, okay, we're not gonna kill you, we're just gonna stick you with a needle, it's not gonna be as bad. If you're still treating them like a guinea pig, it looks like it's still unethical. So how do we justify even the trials that are permitted by existing regulations. That's the challenge, I think, the primary challenge of thinking about the ethics of pediatric research. So as Dennis said, I've been thinking about this for a long time now. And the way I first started thinking about it was thinking, okay, let's take a step back. Instead of thinking about research, let's think about other contexts. Let's think about other contexts and ask ourselves the question, is it okay to expose say 10 year olds to risks in other contexts for the benefit of other people. Everybody can think about that for a second. But if you do, and you look around and do a Google search for a while, you'll find out that tens, potentially hundreds of millions of minors, individuals under 18 years old, participate in activities every year that involve risks to them for the benefit of other people. And we typically call these charitable activities. And it's things like planting crops for the poor, or it's selling cookies to raise money, or it's car washes in order to raise money to give to hurricane victims. So many, many minors do this. A lot of us did it when we were minors. And there are a lot of organizations that encourage kids to get involved in charitable activities. So in one way, charitable activities look just like clinical research. It's exposing some minors to risks for the benefit of others. And so the question I have started with was, why is everybody so worried about this practice, exposing some kids to risks for the benefit of others in research? But then when we start talking about charitable activities, everybody seems to be all gung-ho about it and think it's great. What's the difference? Well, here's basically what I think, and we could talk about this for days if people are interested. But here's basically what I think is the difference. It's a difference in how we conceptualize the two contexts. When we talk about research, we talk about the people involved as subjects, as I mentioned before. This is what we're trying to change. And subjects are individuals who get subjected to things. They get stuck with needles. They get stuck in MRI machines. So you're thinking about the participants in a way of things just being done to them. And that puts all of the emphasis on the risks to which they're being exposed. When we think about charitable activities in contrast, I think we think about them in a very different way. We think about them in terms typically of the miners doing things, collecting money, planting crops, washing cars. So notice we're not subjecting them to anything now. They're doing things. And even though those things pose some risk to them for the benefit of others, they're active participants in the activity. And I think that dramatically changes the way we think about the ethics of the activity. It doesn't make the worries go away, but I think it significantly changes the way we think about those worries. And so my general lesson for this session is going to be that I think the primary challenge for thinking about the ethics of pediatric research in the right way, and I think the primary challenge for doing pediatric research in the right way is to try to shift the context where we're no longer treating the kids as subjects, but we're treating them as active contributors or participants in the studies that we enroll them in. And I'll just give you two examples 
to, to finish with, um, we did a survey a couple of years ago where we asked teens and parents what they thought about exposing the teens to risks and the benefit of a charitable activity versus a research study. Did they see a difference? And they didn't. They thought both are fine for the most part and they're willing to do both as long as the risks aren't too high and there's real benefit to other people. We also surveyed a couple of hundred kids at the NIH Clinical Center who are participating in research studies and we asked them what they thought of their role in those studies. And they said, 80% of them said they were proud. They thought they were doing something that was valuable and they felt proud to be doing it. And so what that makes me think is we can't just change the words. We need to actually change the way we treat the kids. We need to explain to them and explain to their parents why the studies are important and that they're contributing to them and really making them active participants in the process. Okay, so I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Um, Molly, do you want to um, step in and share your own experiences thinking about these issues? Sure, absolutely. And I think it will, while discipline wise, it's quite different. I think conceptually they'll fit together in interesting ways. So, um, so my research is qualitative and more specifically it's ethnographic. So as a result, I am always working with participants who are usually adolescents, um, and I am working with them to construct research questions and data over extended periods of time, sometimes only a semester, but typically several years, and on one occasion, for over a decade. And so as such, I trade off external validity for ecological validity. That is to say, I'm deeply committed to real life settings. So my field is education and literacy, and I focus on LGBTQ youth, or adolescents in particular. And as an adolescent, or as an educational literacy scholar interested in LGBTQ youth in the 90s, so when I was doing my doctoral work, I could have worked with youth in schools, but for the most part, this was a humiliating experience for the young people as they were positioned most, almost entirely as victims. The victimization of queer youth was and is well documented and it was not scholarship I was striving to contribute to. Alternatively, I elected to work with youth in a youth run center for LGBTQ youth. And in the decades that have followed, I've been kind of working my way slowly back to schools. So I'll speak to um, three studies that in will inform my discussion of ethics of research with minors. So the first one is that dissertation study. So it was a literacy ethnography. I was interested in how youth used reading and writing for social change. Um, the center was in Philadelphia. As I mentioned, it was in the late 90s. And at my university, which was University of Pennsylvania at that time, the IRB cared very little about qualitative research. I was like, yes, go. You know, there was, there was not much pause. So my study was readily approved with very little specificity in how I would protect the young people with whom I engaged. As a result, I constructed the ethics of the study alongside the youth with whom I worked at the center. I received guidance from the professors who taught me research methods at the university and the adults at the center, most of whom were psychologists and social workers. From the professors, I always, I learned to always, and I mean repeatedly, request assent to document conversations and discussions. This meant before turning on a recorder, asking whether I should pause a recording if a particularly sensitive topic came up during a recording and sharing feedback on trans transcripts and preliminary analyses after recording. From psychologists and social workers, I learned how to respond to a young person who shares thoughts of self-harm, both in the moment with the young person, right after the moment to the appropriate adult and beyond as we continued our work together. But there were also things that I just needed to learn by myself, like when to discreetly share a poem, when to silently share space, and when to invite a young person for a walk to talk. The next study I'll mention took, to, took place at a local LGBT youth center. Um, and it was, um, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, so it was not quite a decade later, so like 2005-ish. Um, several colleagues of mine and I had started a teacher inquiry group um, that was focused on combating homophobia and transphobia in Central Ohio schools. And we kept hearing the teachers say that they just couldn't read LGBT inclusive literature in their classrooms, even though the students in their gay straight alliances or it's now gender and sexuality alliances really wanted to, they were asking to do it. So one of my colleagues, Caroline Clark and I started a book discussion group at the youth center and we invited the teachers and, uh, and students in the GSAs. 
So this group met approximately monthly for three years and we documented their discussions. In this time and place, the IRB cared very much about what we were doing because they understood the population as vulnerable. So we made the argument that the benefit of selecting, reading and discussing LGBTQ inclusive books in a supportive context was great. We also argued that the risk of students being exposed to increasing homophobia and transphobia in their homes and even the possibility of their being pushed out or kicked out of their homes as a result of having signed a consent or having a consent form signed that essentially outed the young people to their parents or guardians was also great. So we were able to argue for a waiver of consent in that study. And now my most recent project was just a few years ago. Um, I did a teacher inquiry project where I taught an LGBT themed literature course at a queer, fr queer friendly high school. And I documented the experience by interviewing participants, participating students at the start and end of each semester, collecting my teaching materials, collecting their student work and recording class meetings but not all of the students were participating. All students wanted to participate, but some of their parents or guardians would not allow it. Because I held power over them as a teacher and that I graded their work, a waiver of consent seemed inappropriate to me. So some students didn't even ask their parents or guardians. They just waited until they turned, in and turned 18 and turned in their own consent forms. One parent removed a student from the class when his child asked him to sign the form. Other parents and guardians wouldn't even allow their kids to take the class with the LGBTQ in the title. And I never documented anything without consent or in the case of class recordings, I would simply not transcribe the verbal contributions of the students who had not um, given, who had not had parental consent. I simply, um, but I always worked to serve the kids who reached out to me, talking about books with them, what I had read that might interest them, what they had read that might help me better select books for them and bringing them books to enjoy. In this context, I had to be a person and a teacher before being a researcher. That was my most ethical position in this and all the studies I've conducted. Thank you so much, Molly. And last but not least, uh, Mark, would you uh, just share your own experiences and challenges that you faced? In the field. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and so uh, I, I love this panel because it is so so diverse. Uh, we all have uh, the, the same issues that we approach, but we approach them from potentially rather different angles. Uh, so uh, as you said earlier, and, and hi, Dave, by the way, nice to see you again uh, from our time in Capcorn. Um, but uh, I am a pediatric intensive care physician uh, and investigator. Uh, that means uh, I care for, in my clinical life, uh, children ranging from newborn infants up to and including adults who have or are at high risk for life-threatening problems. Uh, and these would be acute life-threatening problems. So uh, as you might imagine, this is a rather high stakes environment. Uh, this is the area of the, the children's hospital where uh, mortality is the highest, where morbidity is the highest. These are the sickest of the sick. Uh, and you might imagine that that's a challenging place uh, in which to ask and answer biomedical research questions, and it is. Uh, but it also has, in my view, uh, a great value uh, in trying to understand how to save the lives of these uh, most desperately ill children. So uh, we're faced with a number of challenges in, in our research environment. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the vast majority of our patients are unable to provide consent. The vast majority of our patients are, are unable to provide assent because they are either too young uh, or they are under the influence of sedative uh, drugs which preclude them from participating in the consent assent discussion. Uh, so we uh, are very, very used to and very, very comfortable with the parent-child unit as the uh, as the research subject. So we, we are, yes, we are involving uh, our, our uh, pediatric patients uh, in the research studies, but it really is the parent-child unit that we interact with uh, as it relates to informed consent, assent, and, and ongoing, uh, you know, uh, study-related communication. Uh, so we have research projects ongoing in the intensive care unit 
that range from uh, pure data-driven projects that would involve information from the medical record or the, the, the monitor data capture system uh, that would not uh, require informed consent at all in that we get a waiver of informed consent from the IRB once they're uh, assured of our data uh, handling uh, security procedures. Uh, to observational studies that do involve interacting with the patient, sometimes involve getting biological samples, blood samples and such, uh, up to and including intervention clinical trials in which the children get study drug. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's ex an exceptionally challenging environment to get consent from families for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, this is an exceptionally emotionally charged time uh, in families' lives. Uh, and as you can imagine, it would be difficult to walk into a room of, of a, a critically ill child, particularly a newly critically ill child, uh, to uh, go over a seven-page consent form with lots of legal language uh, and to uh, get true informed consent from a family. Put on top of that, the fact that many of our subjects are eligible for more than one uh, research study. Uh, and because these patients, their information, their specimens are so valuable, we do try to co-enroll in as many things as we can so that we can uh, really maximize that patient's uh, experience and, and contribution to our understanding of pediatric critical illness. Uh, and so, Again, our research coordinators uh, and our investigators need to develop expertise in how to uh, uh, fairly and, and ethically uh, uh, prioritize uh, research studies that are offered uh, to families of critically ill children. Uh, then of course, there's the issue of the family not being there, uh, despite what you might imagine. Uh, very frequently, parents aren't at the bedside of a critically ill child. Uh, Nationwide Children's has a very large catchment area. Some of our families are coming from many hours away and the child beats them into the hospital because they're transported by air and, or another uh, rapid means of, of, of transport. Uh, sometimes the families uh, might have children who are elsewhere or family members who are elsewhere. Sometimes the, the family member themselves might be injured if it's a trauma study. Uh, and so we have great challenges in using uh, telephone consent, internet-based consent, and so forth uh, to, to make sure that the families are educated and provide appropriately witnessed informed consent for uh, clinical trials. Then there's the issue of the fact that our patients often provide us with biological samples that themselves outlive the patient's childhood. So uh, some of the, the conversations that Dave's been involved with with our network has to do with uh, the operation of biorepositories uh, for, uh, as, as, as sort of side outputs from clinical studies. Uh, you could imagine that if you were collecting a biospecimen, let's say plasma or, or even more interesting uh, DNA uh, from uh, children, uh, and holding it in a biorepository to perhaps ask and answer unrelated questions uh, down the road, that you'd be very, very challenged to try to find that child two, four, 10, 12 years later when that child turns 18 to reconsent them for uh, the ongoing holding of biospecimens in a biorepository and, and their use. Similarly, if you had a, a DNA study in which you collected biospecimens uh, and had that person's genome, at what point does that person need to provide input into your ability to hold their genetic material? And can their family, as say a two-year-old, give lasting and binding consent to hold that genetic material in perpetuity in such a way that the patient does not or cannot be contacted uh, about uh, genetic results as the, as the, the patient ages. Um, again, trying to understand the relationship between obligation to the child, obligation to the future adult, and the practicability of uh, recontacting and, and informing uh, subjects of delayed results are things that we struggle with every day. Uh, and uh, I'd be very happy to, to participate in discussions about that or anything else related to pediatric research. So thank you so much, um, Dave, Molly, and Mark, for just bringing up the variety of challenges that um, research involving uh, children uh, involves. And it's like, we have a wide sample of issues, obviously, and it really is 
um, interesting to see how there are points of contrast and also uh, analogies between the different disciplines. I just wanna invite the audience to think about questions that you have given your practice or your interests, um, please type them out and we'll have time to ask some questions in the Q&A. But before we do that, um, and as people are writing out their questions, let me just ask a few sort of starting questions that I would love to sort of see the sort of disparate perspectives on. So the first is um, something that uh, both Molly and Mark brought up, which was this issue of, you know, the um, potential conflicts maybe between parents or guardians and children. So how should these possible conflicts be anticipated and addressed when they come up? Um, and you could think about conflicts in different sorts of situations. So one example is when the parents are more invested and interested in participation for research and the child seems a little bit more cautious. And you could think about the sort of reciprocal um, uh, experiences of, of when a child is more interested or the adolescent is more interested in participating in research. And it might be in the child's interest to um, not have family input um, as to whether or not to decide to participate. Um, so I would love to get your thoughts um, and feel free to chime in whoever has any sort of, I'm not gonna call on anyone unless I have to. <laughs> I know my examples will be really um, different but I'll just get us started on the conversation. Um, so when, So I've never had parents who were more eager for their kids to participate than the kids in any of the work that I've done. So I can't speak to that, but I can, I can speak to when the kids want to participate and the parents don't want them to. I'd mentioned when kids, you know, express interest and I just try to be the teacher or the person in the space, but not the researcher. But the, in the case where we had the waiver um, of consent, we did have one time where, um, a kid who came to the book discussion group and had been active in the book discussion groups. Father came to the youth center and the youth, the youth center, you're only allowed to be in there if you're within the age range of the youth. Um, but he came like, like banging on the door and like there's like an intercom and like, who are these gay people trying to make my kid gay? Like really just fury. And he, he was really, really um, belligerent. And um, we were afraid for the student, right? And so they, they had to like keep him at the front door, get us all out of the back door so that the kid could get home before the dad got home, you know? And so I, I worry about not having everybody on board. Like that really um, gave me pause. On, like while I believed in the waiver of consent that we did for that, that particular incident um, um, made me question whether or not it was the right way forward and whether, and that kid ended up getting pulled from a queer friendly school and put somewhere and, and that's just hard. I, I feel complicit in that unfolding. I, I was going to say that there are exceptions and maybe the, one of the most interesting parts of this is to talk about the exceptions, but in general, I think the participation of a minor in research requires the agreement of both the minor and the parent. So the exceptions might be interesting to talk about, but so talking about the, the general rule it requires them both to say yes and be willing and to continue to be willing. And therefore, in a sense, the one who says no wins. Mm -hmm. if one of them says no, then they're out, whether that's the minor or that's the parent. And for me, there are a couple of worries in terms of implementing that. The first one is, making sure that you really get a genuine sense, particularly from the minor of whether or not they're willing to be in the study. And so when we have these cases at the NIH, what I'll frequently do is try to get the opportunity to speak to the minor independently of the parent to see that you're really getting their view of whether or not they're willing to be in the study and willing to participate in the research. The second worry or the second issue for me is to try to protect the minor from any concerns that might arise if they're disagreeing with their parents and their parents might not like 
the fact that the miner is disagreeing with them. And so what I try to do both when we do consults, but also when I review studies is to tell investigators to try to anticipate that and to try to think of ways, if the miner doesn't want to be in, to think of ways to present that, or maybe sometimes even to conceal that. And just to explain that the minor is not going to be in the study without putting them in a dangerous position with respect to their parents, if the parents are really gung ho about them being in. Yeah, and, and my experience is, is similar in that you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, it, it, there are there are sometimes when uh, we've had uh, patients consented into studies by the parents and the child is sedated or unable to participate in that conversation. But then when the child regains the ability to provide assent, provided they're over the age of, of assent, uh, then we are required and we do make sure that the child still uh, you know, wants to be in the, in the study or, or, or teach the child about the study and assent them into the study uh, newly. And if they say no, then they're out. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's rare, uh, but it certainly happens. Uh, I think, it, it, interestingly, in the intensive care unit, it, again, when we, we initially approach a family for consent, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the legal guardian who provides the, the consent for, for the, the, the study, and it's their assessment of risk-benefit uh, that is what drives that enrollment. Uh, and you know, many, many times uh, in the intensive care unit, we might have a child who has a breathing tube in their airway. They have multiple uh, IV catheters in place. They're getting stuck with needles multiple times a day as part of routine clinical care. Uh, and the family member will refuse to consent for an observational study that involves a cotton swab in the nose. And that, that's the, the, the research intervention. Uh, and while that may seem counterintuitive and maybe even irrational, you have to understand that that is that parent's only element of control that they have on that entire situation. And it's, it, is, it is right and it is just for them to exercise control in whatever way they feel is beneficial to their child. Uh, and so we, we don't fight them on it, right? We, we, we give them the informed consent document, we go over it with them and what they say we do. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's our job to educate the families as in, in as unbiased a way as we can uh, about the risks and benefits of a research protocol, uh, and then ultimately educate the child once they become uh, able to provide assent. Now, I got to tell you, if there's a five-year-old who is not above the age of assent from a legal perspective, uh, I'm not going to hold them down and do something unpleasant to them. Uh, even if their parents say it's okay, in all likelihood, because uh, again, uh, we want mom, dad, both, neither, whichever the, the 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 legal guardian situation is for that child to be on the same page as the child and on the same page as us. So we want all of the family members who are involved in in medical decision making to be on the same page. Thanks, and so. Um... The next question is about, and some questions are coming in, so thank you very much, and continue please asking uh, questions. Uh, this is a message to the audience. So um, children are a protected class, and that means that sometimes we don't end up getting data um, regarding how certain medical or public policy interventions are going to affect children, even when we have the data for adults. So COVID-19, uh, the vaccine trials is a case in point about this potential tension, right? So currently, um, I think there's uh, trials for children 12 to 17 before um, at uh, approval time, um, emergency use approval, um, there wasn't any research done on minors under uh, ages 16 and under, I believe. And so, um, one question that I have for all of you, and one thing to, I think this is something that medical researchers think a lot about, but I would love to hear also about like pedagogical questions and sort of more public policy questions. How should we balance the risk to particular participants with the benefits that can accrue from the generalized knowledge to the population that they're representative of? Um, and are there ways to sort of protect and guard against, um, you know, 
the risks, but at the same time ensure that the research, uh, the needed research is being done. I mean, I'll, I'll take the COVID-19 argument because that, that's of great interest to me. Um, the, I, I think the, the, the mul there are multiple factors that need to go into thinking about whether uh, you know, children should be prioritized for, for research. In the case of COVID-19, of course, the burden of pediatric disease is very, very low. Um, the overwhelming majority of children who get uh, COVID-19 are either asymptomatic or have uh, mild uh, infections. Uh, and that, that does speak to the prioritization of studying vaccination in the more at-risk populations. But there's more to it than that uh, as it relates to COVID. Uh, and that has to do with the concept of uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. So again, for those of you who haven't uh, thought a whole lot about COVID in kids, uh, there is a relatively rare uh, sequela of uh, COVID infection in the pediatric population, whereby uh, children about a month after infection uh, can get a life-threatening vasculitis heart failure syndrome uh, that, again, can be fatal. And here at Nationwide, uh, in, in the peak in the peak of the last COVID surge a month or two ago, we were seeing two or three a week who were near death with this MISC problem. Now, I will tell you that last summer, when this was first reported out of the United Kingdom, and it's presumed to be an autoimmune phenomenon in the aftermath of COVID infection, the vaccine development community gave a collective, oh, crap. What if we develop a vaccine that is targeting the wrong antigen or the wrong epitope and we give a whole bunch of patients this MISC disease, which we didn't have a month ago or a year ago or two years ago, uh, so they said last summer. So really, it, again, it speaks to the risk benefit ratio of uh, prioritizing children in research. In COVID, the, the, ch the pediatric population had a very low burden of disease. Their role as a vector of disease is poorly understood. And the development of a vaccine could have pediatric specific risks that were not apparent uh, you know, before the uh, uh, pandemic hit. So uh, again, it's an extremely complicated problem that requires thinking about all of those things. Maybe I'll, con I'll continue the uh, multidisciplinary approach to these issues and think about it in a very different way. Can introduce a little bit of philosophy here. Maybe we'll see if the numbers of participants go down dramatically in the next minute or two here, Dana. But one way to think about this issue is, as you're saying, is to think about individual kids and then kids as a group. And the worry that a lot of people have been explaining, if you look at the history of the regulations, what they did was basically think about individual kids, that they can't consent, that they're vulnerable, that they're a protected class. And if you think about them in that way, you want really high, strong protections and limit the research that they can be in. The problem, of course, is if you make it too hard to do research on kids. So this is a problem we're seeing now with research in pregnant women where there are similar, even stronger protections. If you protect the individuals too much, then you undermine the interests of the group. You can't do research to help kids. You can't do research to help pregnant women. And then potentially at least the consequences of those decisions come back to haunt the individuals you are trying to protect because now they don't have effective treatments. And it raises, I think, really fundamental questions about thinking of individuals as individuals, thinking about them as members of groups, and the extent to which the interests of the one are relevant to the other. So for people who know a little bit of moral philosophy, so if you're a consequentialist about this, you just say, look, exactly what we care about is the group, because those are the big numbers. So we should really minimize the protection for individuals, do the research we need to do even it exposes individuals to really high risks because what we care about is we care about helping as many people as we can. Whereas if you think that the individuals, kids have 
very strong rights, then you get a very different perspective on the answer. And I think trying to get the right balance there is one of the real challenges in all of this. To build on that thinking, one of the things I think about is also how, how do we mediate the damage that we do, right? So, so in the case when we, when something does go poorly for the individual on behalf of the group, what you know to, to uh, you know IRB requires that we think through. So what are we going to do about that, right? And so in my case, it's very different than in y'all's cases. But like, I always have to have a relationship with the uh, counselors at the school. So if I have a conversation that's gonna that's really upsetting to a kid, that at least I am making sure that and and, and it's for making schools more queer friendly and um, for all kids. Um, but in that situation, I make sure they get to the counselor and that they are getting some kind of the kind of support that they need. So like how to just mediate the damage we do. So I'm going to move to some of the particip uh, the uh, questions from the audience um, because they uh, speak to some of the points that you've already um, brought up. Um, so the first question is, um, something that Dr. Hall brought up was the fact that sometimes biological samples from children last longer than the actual child themselves um, as a Henrietta Lacks situation, has a Henrietta Lacks situation ever occurred with research samples from children? And I would bring, I would, I want to generalize that question and think about the way in which um, the research might outlast not necessarily the child's life, but who the child is at the time that um, authorization has happened to um, to give this research, right? So this is related to biospecimen samples, but it's also related to some of these issues related to education, right? Part of the interesting feature about doing research on children is they might become very different people with very different values than the ones that they had when they um, originally assented and when their parents um, authorized the research. So how should we think about these duties post-research to research participants and when it comes to, you know, um, bio, biological samples to contributors to uh, re repositories. Yeah, I, I can tell you our experience as part of the network. It's it really, um, and, and to be fair, uh, the, this approach uh, may vary from IRB to IRB, uh, and certainly might vary from project to project, depending on how sensitive or what, what quality and, and quantity of data are being collected. Um, but. Right now, for at least for our network, the burden has been shifted up front to the legal guardian who's signing the consent form and the language that's in the consent form. Um, as far as the Henry, Henrietta Lacks situation, I think we are much more uh, aware of uh, disclosing um, uh, the, the, the nature of what specimens will be used for in the future, or at least acknowledging to the person who's uh, from whom we're soliciting consent uh, that um, that we don't know what it could be used for. And it could be used, used for lots of things, um, but uh, we have thus far not needed to go back to the children who have then become adults uh, and reconsent for our biological specimens because it was viewed to be uh, not practicable and therefore would be an impediment for any meaningful science to come out of the samples. Uh, and again, that, that would be different if perhaps it was a smaller cohort or an easier to track cohort. Um, but uh, I would say there really isn't a single boilerplate answer to that question. Just gonna, there's a couple strands to that. I was trying to figure out which one to pick up, maybe I'll just say two things quickly. One is that if you look at the history of this, it's a little bit of what I was saying in my comments earlier, where initially people were worried about the risks of this type of research. And if you do it in the right way and you code samples, the risks we know to the people from whom you get the samples are almost zero. They're as close to risk-free is almost any activity we've ever encountered in our lives. And so if you're worried about risk, you think, well, then we don't need consent or to talk to these people at all, we can just do it. And I think to the extent you focus on risks, that's right. But I was saying, I think there's another aspect of research participation to think about, which is the contribution aspect of it. And the fact that the people from whom you obtain the samples are gonna to contribute to your research, I think that provides a reason why you should ask them, you should inform them and tell them what you're going to do. 
And I'll just quickly give, maybe there's regulators on, I'll drive nuts here, IRB members. So I think, so take a kind of research that Mark does, you have a four-year-old who gets a very bad infection, ends up in the ICU for a month, and then Mark does his heroic stuff, cures the kid, and the kid goes on to a healthy life for another 60 years. Mark took those samples when the child was four. The child didn't understand what was going at all. Mark got appropriate agreement and permission from the parents to keep the samples and use them in his future research. He's never gonna contact that kid again. In fact, the research isn't about that adult anymore. It's about this four-year-old who had this nasty infection. The regulators will tell you, as Mark is saying, that when that child turns 18, we have, we have this profound question we have to ask now. We have to get re-consent from this child because we never got their assent. I actually think that's wrong. I think it's a mistake. And I think it's a confusion from regulators from OHRP actually who, who interpret the regulations. If Mark did it right, he got consent for that research when he talked to those parents when the kid was four and the parents agreed to it. That's the consent he needs. And once you get that, that's the consent for him to do future research on those samples. So I think there's just no need at all to re-consent kids when they're 18. Now, I think there are exceptions if Mark wants to go back to those kids, if it has future implications for them, if he wants to get more blood from them. There are a lot of cases in which, yeah, of course, there's going to be ongoing interaction. But if there's not, I think there's just no need for any kind of reconsent at all. And I think it's just a confusion. I just wanted to make something a little controversial here. I don't want everybody to go away happy, Dana. It is nice to hear that other people have tensions like that. Um, but in ethnographic research, like I maintain the relationships. And so it's one of my favorite things, actually, as I'm writing about somebody much later to be like, hey, this is what I wrote about you. What do you think? You know, and to, and to get their uh, kind of um, uh, retrospective view on my analysis of what I saw happening in the time. And it's not that I say that it's right that i'm not trying to get them to tell me i'm right and i don't tolerate them telling me i'm wrong but instead i just learn more about them as a result of the continued communication and it doesn't happen with all of them but with the adolescents with whom i've developed the most um you know the deepest um, relationships there are people like from my dissertation study who are now you know grown ups and parents and and i get to continue to learn from them um and i feel really grateful for that So the next question is a combination of two questions, one from uh, Andrea Davis and one from Marlisa um, Niss. So um, Marlisa asks, I conduct research in the NICU. What strategies do you recommend for approaching families of critical ill children for research studies, especially if the study is observational and offers no direct benefit to the child? In my case, mothers are also experiencing post uh, are also postpartum, um, so um, that that might add additional levels of complexity. Um, and Andrea Davis's question um, is also related to the sort of undue, like some pressure that families might feel and parents might feel when their childs are in these high stakes situations and there is no um, evidence based uh, treatment option, and they might feel this sort of pressure to. Um, do something, right, um, including um, uh, having their child participate in research. So how should uh, researchers approach these families who are under duress and um, have very limited options? So lots of great stuff in there to unpack. So um, I'll take the, you know, how do you approach the, the critically ill family unit uh, first? Uh, and that's clearly uh, a, a skill uh, there, there's, there's both skill and art to uh, understanding uh, how and when to approach uh, a family who's in duress. There, there are times when you walk by the bed space and you just look in and you know, okay, now's not the right time. I'm going to come back in, in a few minutes or a couple hours and try again. Um, so in, in, in my uh, research program, uh, all of our research coordinators who do the bulk of the informed consent work are current or former ICU bedside nurses. Uh, in other words, you, you find people who know how to talk uh, to families under the circumstances in which you're likely to encounter them in the research environment. So uh, I think experience, practice, coaching, mentorship, all of those things are very important. Um, as it relates to observational science, I, it's been my experience that families are far more likely to consent to observational 
uh, studies than they are to interventional studies in critical uh, critical illness. Uh, our consent rate for observational studies is somewhere around 80%. Our consent rate for interventional clinical trials is somewhere around 50%. Uh, and this is largely because these uh, families uh, are very attuned to risk. Uh, and uh, if, if you're doing an observational study that involves getting a couple of blood samples from a previously placed vascular catheter, that, that really is a very tiny risk for the subject. Uh, if you're talking about giving a, a, a therapeutic drug or, or a, a tr trying a new therapy, yes, there's, there's a possibility of benefit, but there's also the possibility of harm. Uh, and the fallback for a lot of parents is, you know what, we're going to go with clinical judgment. We're going to go with what the medical team uh, you know, wants to prescribe, and we're not going to add something new to the mix. So I think in the informed consent process to the second questions meet, uh, it's, it's all a matter of giving an unbiased assessment of risk and benefit. Uh, and uh, we, we do that in our clinical trials all the time. We, we, we try to indicate to the family, uh, if you are in the study, this will happen. You have this possibility, but you also have this possibility. And uh, uh, we, we try to frame that in as uh, clear language as we can. Uh, and that's why I think about half of the families are going to say yes. And about half of the families are going to say, you know what, I'm just going to stick with clinical judgment and, and uh, see what happens. So maybe I'll ask two final questions since we only have three minutes left. And thank you so much um, to the audience for asking all these like incredible questions. Um, so these are two that are not related. So feel free to choose whichever one. So uh, from Susan Meyer, when developing new drugs, treatments or policy implications, right? Typically they're first tested with adults and later with children possibly. Are there situations in which it would be more ethical to start the research related to children rather than starting with adults and um, trickle down. And then the second question is from Ashley Glass. Research can be complicated to explain to a child when a child can't understand that they're even participating in research. Um, should, uh, could the child participate still, could the child participating still be justified based on the charitable action argument or um, if they don't provide assent, can you still um, uh, have the child participate in the research? I'll, I'll quickly pick the, the first question. And, well, do I want to pick the first question? I have two minutes to go. Committed, Dave. <laughs> What's that? You've committed. <laughs> I committed. No. No, I may just say that's going to be hard. I'm just going to say quickly for the second one is that one of the things to think about, it's not just getting agreement, but it's also you have to think about the risks of the studies. And typically minors can only be in studies, as I said, that don't benefit them if the risks are low. So even as Mark was saying, you have a kid who can't ascend, if they're being upset by being in that study, then being in that study is likely going to exceed the risk levels that are approvable for them. So you're not going to be able to have them in the study anyway. So you need to get them to a point where they can do it in a at least reasonably comfortable way. You know, that being said, there, there are patients who never uh, are able to provide assent because they're infants or they are neurodevelopmentally uh, uh, unable to provide that or, or they never regain the ability during the course of the study is ongoing. Um, and, you know, in, in, in an additional answer to that question, there are patients that we have in research programs that don't provide assent all the time. Uh, and in that case, we do uh, because they're not able to. Uh, and in that case, we do rely entirely on the consent document uh, to justify the patient's participation. In terms of like doing research with youth and moving up instead of down, I will say around issues of intense biases that oftentimes younger people are much more open and we have much more to learn from them in terms of like combating homophobia and transphobia, for example. And so it has a distinct benefit to start with young people and go up. So I'll just and you're out of time. Quick for that, maybe for somebody to think about is you can have dilemmas where if you start with older people who can consent, the risks are a lot higher. And if you start with really little kids who can't consent or even assent, the risks are a lot lower. And those, I think, pose really interesting dilemmas because we care about low risks and we care about consent. And you have to figure out what to do when they come apart. And I think sometimes the right thing is to go with the lower risk one. And so start with the kids. 
Well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for participating. Uh, thank you for the audience for asking all these great questions. Um, and uh, join us next month for uh, the importance of minority representation in research. Um, so I'll see you all later. <laughs>